One, two, three. Welcome to Scaled the My name is Joe Austin. And if you've just joined us, can I explain to you that Scaled the is a joint production of Vulture Fierce to Hear and Fail and Fumble. Uh, my guest tonight is Pete Sherlow, Professor Pete Sherlow, I to give you a full title. Someone who has a, a long and illustrious academic career. And I have to say, Pete, first of all, thank you for taking time out. And I, your, your living room looks beautiful. It's really, really like a, it's like a university <laughs> setting. There. <laughs> but I, I, last night I was doing, and I've known you a long way, but last night I was doing some research uh, just for today, just to give me a, a beginning of, a, of, a, of, of our interview, of our discussion. And your academic career, it has some portfolio of work. It goes back. 50, at least 50 pieces of work. You know, director of the Irish Institute at Liverpool University, assistant director of conflict transformation at Queen's University, formerly, I should say, and someone who has been involved in conflict studying in a global sense, right around, right around the globe. And you also have a, an association with the Mitchell Institute uh, in America. So. Let's deal with you and then we'll deal with your career because the two, while they're interlinked, are not necessarily the same thing. And people will gather from your accent that you're not a scouser. So tell us a wee bit about, about the young Pete. Well, uh, uh, I suppose all of these things seem unremarkable, but I suppose they seem very ordinary. But yet again, all of our lives are remarkable in our own way. And of course, born in 1965 I know he looked younger but uh, the uh, you know you, you know obviously the first thing that really came into your mind was the the conflict and, uh, and, and sort of early memories of that but you know uh, born into the, the standard Protestant family a boy and a girl uh, mother and father like most people in those days were working class people uh, my mother was a country person which gave us uh, a very interesting part of our life because we would go out to the countryside every Sunday and, uh, you know, they, they, they spoke with the throttle and they spoke with the tone and they had different interests than us city slickers. And uh, my dad was from uh, a very industrial trade union background. Uh, his grandfather, uh, when he came back from the First War, uh, worked as a trade unionist in uh, Barber Threads and he was banned. Uh, because he tried to organize trade unionism in the factory. And he was told uh, that basically he was a communist, etc. And he ended up having to labor uh, and could, didn't have that sort of skilled job that he had because of that, uh, that type of background. And my grandfather, uh, a famous story about him is when the Queen was coronated in the early 50s and she was driving from Storm into Hillsborough. And there was, uh, they lived in neighbors' cottages between Belfast and Lisburn. And uh, a local Orange Lodge member turned around to the woman next door who's a Catholic and said to her, uh, the Queen doesn't want to see the likes of you. And my grandfather jumped over the wall and knocked him out and yeah. said, her two sons are lying at the bottom of the Atlantic yeah. and your two sons never fought for king and country, they hid in the factory. So, you know, it, it was that type of background. Uh, you know, they were, they, they weren't, rapidly <laughs> sort of left wing etc but i most certainly did grow up in a home that was very anti-sectarian and uh, my own father who passed last year with COVID, uh he actually i remember one of my first memories was when there was intimidation of a catholic family he went up with a pickaxe and he stood between the the mob small mob still a mob yeah yeah mob's a mob next person who steps forward i'll cleave the head off him. So, you know, that's all very interesting in that sense. You know, I grew up in that environment. Always remember uh, the troubles in the sense of uh, those depressing mornings when you got up and you put on the radio and you heard some terrible piece of news. And I always remember this. My mother used to say that's somebody's son, that's somebody's daughter. Yeah. So I'm not saying we weren't, you know, unionists and we weren't. Uh, the house had lots of uh, little mugs and plates of... Her Majesty and all of that, but you know, I, I think that's a very important thing because I think we've lost a lot of those sorts of stories. 
And we've sort of forgotten that people, you know, I'll give you another story. My, my dad was a van driver and we went into South Armagh and uh, we went to this place. He was delivering car parts, but he also collected money on a Friday. And we went in and the guy who owned the business, his, I think two of his brothers were in long cash, uh, Republicans. And uh, my dad basically said, you haven't paid your bill for a few weeks. And as he was saying it, two guys came into the, the office and the guy turned around and said to my dad, how dare you speak to me like that? I have wages to pay. You think I'm not going to pay you? Come in the back here and I'll give you a check. And my dad went, this, he, I can see him sort of like, what's this all about? So my dad went in to get the check and the guy says, have you got money in the van? And he said, yeah. And he said, go out to the van, get your money, bring it in here, leave it in the safe. I'll give you a check. Come back in an hour. We drove down the laneway and the two guys who'd been in the office stopped the van, pulled out a pistol, stuck it in my dad's face and searched the van. So I, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to smooth over what we went through, but, but very much those things were very instructive. And you're asking about why you ended up where we are or why I ended up thinking the way I do. It was that type of environment where people looked out for each other and people protected each other, despite all the horrors of the conflict. Were you haven't said, and I don't know, so I'm asking the question, were you an only child? No, I had a sister. I sort of said we had a Protestant family, two children, one boy, one girl. Sorry, you did say so. And, <laughs> the, uh, and we had two sisters. And we were the only two kids in the street who went to grammar school. So the other thing was, uh, despite my parents being working class, they had very middle class values. So my mother would answer the phone like Mrs. Bouquet. <laughs> and, uh, and it's even those things you forget, Joe, because my dad worked for this English company. We had a phone. And uh, do you remember these have the wee box beside the phone where people yeah. get a, yeah. it they made a phone call? So people would come to our house and they remember they would book a call. Somebody in England here, that somebody in England was on there or somebody of the company was on there. And as a kid, I used to always think about it because you knew whenever they finished the call, the phone rang back and the, 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 the operator would say 27p or 1,020 or whatever yeah. it was. And of course, they'd always say, oh, there's something for the wee boy. And you used to always wait until you heard the click. Yeah. And he'd go out. So I would, uh, and not that I became a, a Bill Gates entrepreneur, but but it's those sort of things I think are really important because you forget that people didn't have phones and people relied on each other. And I suppose it's that sort of community spirit that, that that's something that was very important. I, I know that part of your education, <coughs> and you mentioned college, which I want to come back to, but part of your education was done uh, with the Quakers or at the hands of the Quakers. And uh, I say that very generously, not in any derogatory way. I have great, great admiration for the Quakers, uh, uh, not only for their work currently, uh, or even during during the conflict, and it's well known the Quakers ran the soup kitchen at, at Long Cash, where families got at least some respite in their way into a visit. But was there, was there a sense of equality that came through the education of the Quakers? It was certainly, uh, which I always found really interesting when I went to university, was uh, I don't think anybody was better taught in Irish history than us, the guy, those of us who went to French school. It was presented words and all, and uh, was certainly there was a very, very strong liberal ethos. So you'd have that sort of thing, Joe, you'd, you'd be sitting in this sort of liberal ethos school, and you come out and get on the bus, trying to avoid the boys with some cats who were going to beat you up, <laughs> or, or watching boys from... This the Garvey or our school beating them up. But I used to, I always thought that was really peculiar because you sort of went from this working class conflict going on around you. And then for those nine to half three, you were in a, like I went to school, Catholics, Jews, Hindus, Malaysians, all sorts of people. I remember actually saying this once to a guy from uh, East Europe and he goes, you wouldn't get that in the country. So, so, so actually I must say it was, uh, you know, it was, it was quite elitist in some ways. You know, never played rugby or hockey before. And, uh, but, you know, they put me on the stage and uh, they built our confidence. And, and, and certainly there was none of that uh, gender division. Uh, you know, there's a lot of, it was quite peculiar. I think a lot more girls did sciences in our school than did, than did it in uh, other schools and all of that. So, no, most certainly there was this sort of calm, uh, liberal, you know, uh, there was actually one funny story. Uh, me and a couple of lads formed the Anti Nazi League branch, and it, the school had all these societies, CMD, and all of these lefty liberal type things. 
and we formed uh, a group, uh, anti-Nazi league, we wrote to the anti-Nazi league, yeah. and not having really understand what it was, but we were anti-Nazi, and uh, we got the pack, we got this pack for the membership and badges and things like this, and uh, we set it up and went to the headmaster and said, uh, we want to form the anti-Nazi league, and he said, what is the anti-Nazi league, and we said, it's against racism, and he said, we'll have to look into that before we give you permission. So anyway, we were summoned a week later, and we came in, and he said, so you're Trotskyites? <laughs> we were like 14. <laughs> heard of him, I think of her. Oh. So anyway, we tried to brave it out. <laughs> it's sort of like, we, we know what we're doing here and all of this. And he said, Trotskyites, you're members of the Socialist Workers Party. We didn't have a clue what this was, right? Yeah, yeah, and he yeah. said, uh, who you, you remember who one of the most famous people was went to Friends School. And he looked, he took, he looked over the top, took his glasses off, and he went, uh, the school hasn't recovered from Boomer Hobson. <laughs> so, so we were we were told we were allowed to run it, but the, it would be kept at night. So it was that sort of environment, you know, and you could be in CND and there was anti-apartheid material. And, uh, you know, there, there was a debating society. So it was, it was a sort of a world outside of, yeah, it was a bubble. It was, it was a bubble to a certain extent. You mentioned, you mentioned there one of the things that the school was, was uh, keen on was putting pupils on the stage. And I, I looked at a photograph of you last night and you're in a toga. Well, it's either a toga or it's a set of curtains. I hope it's a toga. And I'm told by a former, a former teacher that you were, a, this is his words, that he was a sparkling actor. And he was very much into that kind of the drama of the point. And I think you had, I think you had two leading roles. You had one in uh, Julius Caesar and you had another one in Juniper and the Peacock. Yeah, yeah, no, Sean O'Casey, Price, Sean O'Casey plays. And so that's the environment, you know. We, I remember doing the Sean O'Casey play and there's a crucifix on the stage. And, you know, it wasn't, nobody questioned that or engaged with that. And, I, and that's what I'm saying, that, that thing when you went up to university and you, you, knew, you knew all this stuff of Casey and she, Seamus Heaney came to the school and all of that. So, look, it, it wasn't, uh, it was very much a bubble, but it was something that really had a big influence in my life. And uh, it was, you know, it's like many of these things, Joe, you, you, you're, you could have been in Richmond upon Thames, you could have been in Dublin 4. You know, it, it was just working class boy at a very poor school. And, uh, and, and putting you on the stage, et cetera, you know, gives you a certain confidence and it gives you a certain ability. And I'm sure, you know, the school was like probably 85% Protestant and there we were doing O'Casey and nobody had a, nobody questioned it, nobody thought about it. And you know, I, I think that was an environment which did enrich a lot of us. The, the teacher I was speaking to who, who taught you was Philip War. I know who, I am. Who is a friend of both of ours. And, and I asked him in his own intrepid way, I said to him, if it was a summer report, how would you mark them? You know, normally you find these things could do better, needs to uh, knuckle down or needs to study. And he said, oh, didn't he do well? So so just to let you know that he, he wasn't... He, uh, uh, said I, wrote, I once wrote an essay. I always remember this. I wrote an essay, but I think it, I can't remember. It was at Lawrence, The Darkling Crush. And uh, Phil Orr gave me 13 and a half out of 20, and, which is, what, 67 and a half percent. I assume nowadays a kid would get 95 or 102 percent. And uh, he, he wrote all of this, this glowing, this glowing, but of course him coming from his Baptist background. And it, well, I was sort of sitting there going like, all of these glowing comments, and I got 13 and a half out of 20. And years later, I said to him, I said, you're a bit stingy with the old Morgan, you know, 13 and a half. And he says, that's the highest mark I ever gave. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, uh, it was, it was probably uh, his Calvinist background, you know? But, but, but you see, you see it's, uh, it's not Calvinist, it's Baptist. Yeah, anyway, we'll get into that. Baptist, but, yeah. <laughs> the, thing, the thing that's interesting about it is it was that sort of place that there was a freedom to be expressive. And, and, and that was very something that was very strong within that Quaker ethos within the school. You mentioned, and you have mentioned to me in conversations in the past, and I know it's, I know it's an area you're quite proud of, your working class background and... Not that you've you've ever complained about it, but you you've kind of mentioned it almost as a as a badge of of uh, of your ability, I suppose, without without boasting about your ability. But were you the first person 
from your family to, to go to university? Or so My sister was three years older. She was the first and then I was the second. I'll never forget the day of the 11 plus and you're all standing out in the street. And the postman, all the postman came down the street and he handed out the letters. And we'd all, we had these, we had this uh, group we raked about with and ran up the fields between us and Twinbrook. We'd gone about there and all of that. And uh, two Catholics, four broads, best of mates. And I'll never forget going into the house and opening the letter and coming out. And the only ever time I experienced this is when your, one of your mates got a girlfriend. It was going to be different. It wasn't the same. And I always remember the relationship we had was not the same. And it was uh, no hostility or anything like that. But I just remember that day, it just wasn't the same that you had. And it wasn't that they were aggrieved or anything like that. It just wasn't the same. You, you, and then that's the problem with the 11 plus. And as much as I benefited very much from passing the 11 plus, it did make you different, you know. And uh, not that you, you wanted to be different, but, yeah. like that, but it was just a marker. And I suppose everybody wanted to pass it, and I passed it. And of course, I was like, let's go and do this, or let's go and do this. And it was sort of like, you know, we're off here to do something else. I always stuck with that. But you see, the thing about is that thing as you get older, I think the more you look back, you really start to realize what really formed you was that first 16, 17 years, that that really was the basis of your character. And it's where you learn your humor or where you learn your politics or where you learn your emotions. And uh, I have to say, you know, I was, I was very, I was very, I was very keen when my kids were young that they would, because they're always a middle class, because obviously Una and I have been socially mobile, that, that they would have connections to that world. Yeah. And I think that's been very important. I don't mean that in a patronizing way. No, no. I just feel working class people have humor, the one thing I did notice when I went to grammar school was when you were working class, you sort of sorted it out amongst yourselves. When I went into that middle class world, you sort of sorted out in the long grass. Tell me, I want to ask you this because it, it just strikes me and I have to say this without its own patronizing. I don't know very many professors. I know people who think they're professors, but they're not really professors. There's another word that rhymes with it and that's more likely what they are. But uh, this country boy, a wee bit naive, sheltered upbringing, ends up in grammar school and then ends up, um, maybe against the odds, but ends up in university. Was it a struggle for you? Were you was it a lonely place? Did you fit in? When I went to university? Well, well, both, both in, in, at grammar school and then. There, there were parts of grammar school which were slightly uncomfortable because I was working class. Yeah, was yeah. An elitist uh, teacher who uh, on the first day made us sit in our form class by our father's profession. And when I said my father was a fan driver, he said, that's not a profession, that's a job. And stuck me at the back of the class. So you had that choice, didn't you? Which was, I'll show you. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. And the other thing was, the thing I noticed when I went to grammar school was, many of the people who were posh or whatever, but were very decent, thorough people, but they had no life experience. I always remember that they just didn't have that experience of life. They didn't know, they didn't know things, you know. Like, I, like I, as you know, I'm a big Linfield fan, you yeah, know. Yeah. And even, even sort of even talking about games and people and character and all of that, they didn't live in that world, you know. I, I remember uh, there was a wonderful guy I went to school with whose family were very wealthy, and uh, when I was 18, uh, he invited me up for luncheon. And a lovely, lovely guy, really genuine guy. And we went up to the house. It was him and his three sisters and the mother and father. And I think their living room was about the size of our house downstairs. And they had Jack B. Yates paintings, liberal unionist, big liberal unionist family. And the miter strike, I think, had just started. And the father was sitting reading The Observer. I'd never seen anybody read The Observer before. And uh, we, anyway, he chatted away. And we sat down and I'm sitting there going, like, which knives and forks do you use? Which glass do you use? You know? So I'm looking around to see what you do. And uh, he goes, uh, uh, they all had nicknames, Popsy and Dopsy. And, <laughs> and uh, he goes uh, to, to his son, uh, he goes, uh, what does one think of the minor strike? Daddy, daddy. So he went everybody. And then he came to me and he says, and Peter, what do you think of the minor strike? And I went, sorry, I can't remember his surname, say Mr. Smith. And I go, Mr. Smith, nobody's ever asked me my opinion before. 
<laughs> which is actually true. Nobody ever said, what do you think about a political issue? So I always remember that. No, no, not at all. I, I, I enjoy, you, you form your friendships and you, and you get on with it. You, you do gravitate towards people of your own class. You know, it's, it's, that, it's that remarkable finding. You hang about with people you like. <laughs> and, uh, but when I went to university, i never forget walking into the library and going to myself, I'm staying here. I couldn't believe, I'd never seen so many books. I'd never seen, I went into the lectures and they were talking about philosophy and they were talking about ideas. And I went, this is paradise, absolute paradise. And I had this uh, uh, little timetable that I would work, I go to the library every night, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, go to the library, Thursday, drink. Friday and Saturday, I worked in a, the Dimmery Inn, uh, uh, the Dundurn Inn, or yeah. the, it was so rough, the search of the door, if you didn't have a knife, they gave you one. And I worked <laughs> in there, and that was my life. So, so Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, study, study, study. Thursday, drink. Friday, Saturday, work. And I just loved it. And uh, I just, I just, just ideas and creativity and Flora Gardner's bookshop you'd go in and have all the pamphlets along the wall, all the different types of Republicans and left groups and all of that there. So anyway, no, I did enjoy myself and I did uh, partake in the old drink and all of that. So I wasn't a complete, <laughs> I wasn't a Lord Fauntleroy, but I did, I, what else? Well, you know, it was just to me, it was heaven. Was there, was there a saying in university that you were going to be into academia? In fact, you were going to be one of the people that you, that you uh, tried to avoid when you were a student, uh, a lecturer or a teacher? There was, a, there was definitely that first day, which was, how do you stay here? And, and, and then uh, at the end of my first term, I remember getting an award for the highest grades. And then I was really lucky. I got a scholarship and went to America. And I went to a place called Iowa, uh, which is about three hours drive from uh, Chicago. So I had this scholarship and uh, being naive, of course, <coughs> I flew to Manchester, flew from Manchester to New York and got on a bus. I didn't know where it was. Right? So I went into Lisburn Library and found an encyclopedia and found one paragraph. But, but, but I was attracted by the scholarship, which meant I could do it, you know. And uh, I went there, and I'll never forget this. First lecture I had was in conflict. And the lecturer comes in, and he says, anybody here from conflict zones? South Africans, Nicaraguans, El Salvadorians, anywhere in the world, you name it, they were all there. Okay. So you gone from this white world into this multicultural world. And the guy, and I don't mean this in any way to be offensive to anybody. Yeah. And the guy, of course, says, hey, you know, you Americans, um, you want to hear of these guys' experiences? South African guy, father was standing at a bus stop, police officer, police, police, police officer in the car, shot him in the head, drove off. Uh, Nicar I can't remember if it was Nicaragua, but it was a quarter of a million dead, da 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 da, da and I was sitting there being please don't ask me. <laughs> because, because, of, because I was going to say whatever it was. And that's not in any way, to, any way, take away from the suffering of people here. But it was the very first time I really realized the Palestinians, people are in that room, the real suffering that people had. I, I, don't, I know we suffered as well. I'm not at all detracting from that. But but it was just that thing you're going like, my God, what are these other people? Are, you know, like, you know, guys who were just talking, who'd been growing up in absolute poverty, had won scholarships. So they were escaping and fleeing, whereas I wasn't. I was just I was just looking for something different, you know, just a year away and stuff like that. And of course, then the great thing, sorry, Joe, yeah. I want to go on to talk about your experiences in the conflicts, and you mentioned the Bosnia, Iraq, Palestine, Israel, and so on. But but what I'm interested in is is that journey, the, the continuity of that journey. So, what year were you in America? 85, 84, 85. Yeah. Things were bad here. We we yeah. came out of the hunger strike, and and they were pretty bad. And that experience that you're that you're mentioning, and I think sometimes, and it's a human experience that we are, particularly in those dark days when we were absorbed with our own conflict and all the stuff, you can't away forgot that there were other conflicts, and 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 it's not about what was the worst or what was the best. No, how do you measure? It? But did that did that American trip, did that experience with other people who came from conflict zones? Was it, did it any way shape you into your work on conflict resolution or was it, 
that it just happened to be there. It's, it's like anything else. It's just you, you're, you're in a group of people who you socialize with and uh, you just hear more and, and you see bits that are similar and you see bits that are different. And, you know, and what you get is a sort of a graciousness to most people who come from conflict zones that, you know, they've suffered and, and most people are quite resilient. You know, obviously they're very lucky they were educated and they were in scholarships as well. Uh, the the I, I actually was very keen in economics and wanted to be an economics lecturer and uh, came to Liverpool to do a PhD in economic geography. I wrote a PhD on the Shannon Industrial Estate, <laughs> and uh, very, very boring and job. And then uh, Una and I uh, were a young couple at the time, and a job came up at Queen's. So I actually came back as an economic geographer, and it was people came to me and said, uh, mostly from loyalist backgrounds, would you come and help us? There's, you know, we think there's going to be a peace process. And that was about 93, 94. And then uh, I unfortunately met the likes of you guys, you as well, Joe, yeah. around that time and others. And it was it, it, it was not my intention. I was actually very interested in economics and sort of left-wing economics and just the nature of getting caught up in the peace process. I don't mean that in a patronizing way yeah. and getting on with it. And uh, then, of course, uh, what happened was is, is, is that people would say, will you come here and talk about your experiences? Will you come there? You get, net, you get into these networks and conversation and then you end up sitting in Iraq with the, uh, uh, the last time I was in Iraq in Kirkuk, Al-Qaeda tried to blow me up. Uh, <laughs> there was a, a guy caught with a rocket launcher pointed. Just as I got up to speak, that's how boring I am, Joe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, you know, so uh, it's look, Joe. I think a lot of things we end up in life. We don't know why. I, I I think I think you're just you've got an energy, and that energy has to have a force or a movement, or and you, you just end up. With you have mentioned uh, Una a number yeah. of times, uh, and, and and I know that Una's well, one of her many claims to fame is that she's I believe she's from Derry. Yes, so indeed. was it was it. Had you to go that far for a partner? Was it, had your reputation went in front of you, or how did where did you meet Una? We were at university, and I uh, adored Una from afar, and like most men, went up and, <laughs> and uh, I went to America, and uh, the day before I went to America, I bumped into her and her friend, and I said, "Write your address on there, and uh, I'll, I'll write to you when I'm in America." And uh, I wrote there a few times when I was away because I, I was, I just thought she was, she was a beautiful person. I didn't mean that in any way, in a sexist way, but I just love at first sight sort of thing. And uh, when I came back from America and uh, we started, you know, whatever that dance is, that ritual before you become a couple. Courtin, uh, we call uh, it. Courtin. Courtin, yeah. Courtin. And uh, she says to me, have you, have you grown up? <laughs> and I, I promised her that I had grown up and I was not the agent I had been before. And uh, we just started dating, which was, uh, I must say, Joe, never been an issue in terms of our different faith backgrounds. The only problem is when you marry somebody from Derry, you marry one, you marry 40. Absolutely. Uh, and I, I, the thing that I found so bizarre, there were 12 of them, 12 children. I had no understanding of the dynamics of the family. I didn't know who liked who, who got on with who, who was what. What, what was it? Una had really a, avoid. People had nieces and nephews the same age as them. I had no, and people with children, there was always babies about, you know, and growing up in that sort of everybody had two kids environment. Yeah. And of course, it brought you into Derry as well, that, that environment. They had to live in the uh, first year with guys from Derry. And uh, that was a different cultural experience as well. And, you know, people in places are different. Uh, but never. You know, it was one of one or two mumblings about us getting married, etc. But the day, the year we got married, the day we got married, the day the shank of bone, and uh, you know that year I think it was one in twelve weddings. Now the last bit of research we did, I think it's now about a quarter of people. And uh, but I must say, maybe because we were protected, because I was in university, whatever. I don't know why, but it never was an issue. And we have two kids, Eva and Rory. <laughs> Here's the funny thing about how you, how you go on a journey. <laughs> Whenever I first went to university, there was a poster on the wall for president's, president election of the Student Union. 
And I was sitting with this friend who was uh, broad, whatever you call it. And I turned out to him and I go, uh, who will we vote for in the, the students' election? And he went grainy or rainy. And there was a lad from Lurgan who was a Republican. And he said, oh, for, he says, it's grown you and on you. <laughs> <laughs> I ended up with an E for the Rury. Uh, it was, but just that, we were so separated. You know, I wouldn't have known how to pronounce these names or would have heard of them, but never. Yeah, well, I mean, never, never would have known. Well, I, and, uh, and that was it. And, and with the kids, there was never any issues. Uh, uh, Rory had a few things about me being in TV, uh, your dad's abroad and things like that, but uh, generally pretty unscathed. And he's currently dating a girl from uh, uh, Dublin. Um, my daughter's living in England with a British Pakistani guy. And uh, hopefully that sort of multicultural thing is rubbed off on them. Not that somebody from Dublin's multicultural, obviously, but, well, but the, that, that, the, they both went to university outside the of Dublin. Geographical a wee bit away. Yeah, but they, they went away and studied in America and stuff like that. It's all very good. You talked about, which I'm not so sure is, is accurate, but you talked about kind of drifting into, because of your life experience, because of what was happening here, drifting into that, conflict transformation world, that world that's out there and, and how you do it. And, and eventually you became the deputy director up at Queens. Um, one of the things that I find fascinating in terms of professionals, and it, I don't know how accurate this, this figure is, that, that within professionals, the highest rate of suicide is from psychiatrists. So those who are involved in trans transformation, conflict transformation, are dealing very much with the, the pain, the hurt, the, the, the reality, the hardness of conflict and the consequence of conflict. And it, to me, that just is the opposite from your very jovial personality. And people watching this interview will know you laughed at the end of every sentence. Was it, was it a hard decision to go into that world of, of conflict transformation or was it an, acad an academic challenge? What, what was, how did you view that? I think one of the, one of the things, my mother and I were nearly, were nearly killed on Bloody Friday. Uh, we'd walked into Oxford bus station. Sorry, I'm not taking sides here or anything. I'm just yeah, illustrating right, the true right. story. And she worked for Liverpool Insurance Company. And she forgot her person to drag me by the hand. And we were going back to her office. I always remember her grabbing me by the hand and uh, basically the bomb went off. Okay? And then we were standing there and my mother basically uh, uh, freaked, uh, you know, clearly I didn't know, I thought that it was a small boy's freaking, but uh, I think she was obviously having some sort of episode. And a man came along and took us over, I think across the road was Kelly's Cool Yard or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he took us over there and he said, uh, stand here, I don't think there'll be a bomb here. And there were no phones on, they got there. So that always stuck with me, and in the sense that and I, I must be very clear in this, I understand that violence was happening outside of the community that I came from, and uh, I think the way in which my parents dealt with it, there was no anger and no recrimination, and I think that was one of the things that made me realise that there was a space here that you could, you could maybe go in and have conversations about. But that, that, that's an interesting point about the psychology of doing this, because obviously, like yourself, Joe, you hear some really horrendous stories, you know. And uh, I, I, I was brought into Long Kesh to do talks, must have been just before the, in the round, I think, a Good Friday Agreement, just before maybe. And uh, I remember the first day going in, and I was completely and utterly thrown by it. Now, as you know, I'm a... As, as Una would say, you're the man who never shuts up, right? And I was lost. I was when I came out, I was lost for words. And I, th this is my my feeling about it. I, 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 the drabness of the place, the fact you couldn't see the horizon. There was no nature. You know, I was going home to a garden with birds and whatever else. Yeah. The I just thought to myself, this ideology that has brought people here, whatever all of that is, okay. And I don't drink whiskey. And I went home and I walked down to the bottom of the street and I bought a small bottle of whiskey and I took a slug out of it right back. 
and, and I, it was just it was just that sort of you need a break here, I need a breaker here. And I was very happy to go in and do the talks and hopefully they were beneficial, etc. First person I met was Shana Walsh. And uh, that in itself was was a traumatic experience. <laughs> it wasn't anything about it that was traumatic, it was just impressive. And it was impressive in so many different ways. And you know, there's there's times when you're sitting with people and they're all floating and, and all of us get this, it's not unique to me. And uh, you know, it does take you back to that day with my mother. And and if anything is the best thing we cannot offer is empathy. I, and I, I mentioned it when our intro was this, this, this catalogue of work, which is in any, in any sense, in, in irrespective of the study piece, mm -hmm. it is considerable. So there's a, there's a, a dynamo, there's a dynamic there for you to work. And that's clearly why you're where you are today in Liverpool because of your ability. But does anything, and did anything in your background you mentioned getting into law and cash, and it would be it would it was the first of a number of engagements with ex prisoners from from all political persuasions. But was there anything that that prepared you for meeting the people who, for right or wrong, the media had demonized and yeah. the deeds that they were involved in, and war war is horrific and horrendous. But was there was there anything that what I'm trying to get is. Was there an, almost a cultural shock meeting these? No, not at all, because you grew up in a community in which people have been to prison. And uh, also, given I worked in the Demary yeah. Inn, I think yeah. half, the, half the clientele had been to prison. And uh, so it was, it, it was part, you know, you were going to the free matches, you were standing beside somebody who was telling your dad about being inside, etc. So it wasn't anything extraordinary at all. That is not, it wasn't that at all. It, it was, uh, it was it, it, the only thing that did, that one time I went, the first time I went to Long Cash, it was just that nature of oppression. And just, you know, I suppose if you're somebody who really enjoys freedom and freedom for others, you sort of look at that and go, this, this doesn't make sense to me. Why would you end up here? Or why would you, I'm not saying why would you end up here naively? Yeah. Or why would you be lucky? You know, everybody, you know, the prison officers looked miserable. You know, the whole thing was just miserable. And and it's a, uh, so no, no, it was never anything, you know, uh, even though my mother, uh, whatever, whatever the uh, going back to my father, who from time to time would assert his bulk the same same shape as me, and uh, whenever I had a friend who was killed, uh, uh, I was in lower sick and clearly very upset. And I worked in the Demurray Inn, and my dad came in one night to the UDA with a hammer and said, "Pete is not to be recruited into your organisation." Bang, bang! But he's at the big school. You know, I work in Cosmo called Grammar School, big school. Yeah, yeah. Big school. He's going to have a future. You're not to go near him. And this lawyer, this guy, called me and said, We wouldn't have you anyway. You're <laughs> much of a big mouth. <laughs> but, but it was that sort of, you know, so therefore the word, that word, Joe, you know, all the demonization, etc. Like, I, I knew some of those guys. I won't name any names, but I remember one night a very senior member of the UDA, and he had a few drinks in him, saying to me, Why have we become the USF? Why, why have we become that? And it was around the time of the Anglo-Irish Agreement. I'd just come back from America. I always remember that. And you had people there talking about everything, you know, horses, uh, football, left-wing politics. You know, there was a mix of people. So, you know, it's not a, it's not a, it's not a, it's not a word in which these people are all are complete, completely different. The difference is they've engaged in violence. And, and that's the difference. They're, they're still human beings, you know. I don't mean that in a patronizing way either, but you know what I mean? It wasn't, it wasn't a word that was abnormal to me, good about well, that. Let me give you a wee break from, from that kind of gloom, doom, and I'm looking out the window behind you, and it seems to be a wet Liverpoolian day, if that's any sign to be going back. But I asked someone last night, because I, I, I wanted to kind of cover as much about you as I could, in a short period, in an hour, and I said, uh, would he be interested in sport? And they said, no, he supports Liverpool. No, not at all. <laughs> uh, do you? Is that true? Do you support Liverpool? No, no, I support Chelsea, which is the ah, reason they got it wrong. Then. Yeah, is because when 1970 there was they, they played in the FA, the FA Cup was a pretty big day, as you remember, and then there was a replay, and they played on the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday night at Old Trafford against Leeds in the replay, 
And uh, my dad said, get to bed, it's eight o'clock or whatever, go to your bed. And when I was halfway up the stairs, he said, where are you going, you need to come on down and watch it. And so I was like five or whatever. So I, so I went in and Chelsea won and that's the reason why I support Chelsea. And uh, no, I, I, I love sport. I played, I played cricket, under 19 cricket for Ireland. Very and uh, I played for uh, Northern University when I came to Liverpool in the late 80s. Uh, I had a trial for Lancashire, but I found out that I wasn't going to be a very good cricketer after all. Uh, and uh, I uh, still run about the five-a-side pitch, uh, despite my, uh, my, 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 wide, my, wide, my wide girt. And uh, no, for, for sport's very important. Uh, it's one of those things that's actually really important. You know, when you get to that age, when it's increasingly harder to talk to your dad. Yeah, <laughs> because, yeah. Or, or, and also what happens is when you've got a son and he's 16 and you go, oh crap, I've, I've become this silly old man he doesn't want to talk to. But the one thing, my dad every Saturday, up in the van, off to the Linfield matches, and that's where we talked. You know, we talked with that. It was actually interesting. I was, I was, uh, uh, Linfield were playing Glen Torn. Uh, I was about 12 or 13, and the Blues scored in the last minute and won the game. I think we were losing 2-0, and we scored three goals in the second half. And Jimmy Martins, I think he scored three headers. He scored in the last minute. And the Billy Boy song started. And I jumped up and went, hello, hello. Back on my head, my dad took me out, put me in the van. What sort of wee lad are you? Home. You, go, you know we're bad enough when the other parent was brought into the equation. <laughs> Angeline, we have raised a corner boy, singing sectarian games. Right? What sort of wee lad are you? Blah, 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 blah. You're banned from going to the games for eight weeks. Really? Right? Eight weeks later, I was sitting there and he says, have you learned your lesson? And I said, yes. And he says, right, you can come to the game. I was banned for eight weeks. I didn't even sing the. I didn't even sing the offensive line. <laughs> we got to. You didn't even know what you were going to sing anyway. <laughs> but uh, it is the. It's the. There's a heart. There's a bit of. There's a very sectarian line in that. So, but it was that. That was just. You know, I will never remember walking into our kitchen, which is about the size of a tea towel. And Angeline, we have reared. We have raised a corner boy. My so, God. You know. Yeah, tell me, do you? And I, I mentioned the, 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 the volume of work. I think I've mentioned it a few times. Do you find it hard to relax? Are you good at relaxing? Oh, no, no, I'm the, I, I'm the uh, it's, it's 100 miles an hour or at zero. So uh, even, there, even there on Saturday, I got up and did a 20 mile walk around uh, the field beside our flat and, you know, just clear the head and all of that. No, I can turn off completely, go on holiday, turn off the phone, turn off the email. Uh, I, I can relax as good and well as anybody. I never, I never feel, you know, the, the, the times, the pressure, it's never anything else. You know, academia is like anything else. You have people who annoy you, you have people who support you, you have people who say they'll support you, don't support you. Uh, you know, you get all the petty and fighting and all of that as well. But, you know, I think that's one of the things that's interesting. That when I leave here, whenever time I leave, that's the, that's the day over, that's the working day over. It's over. Stop. Go and do something else for your life, you know. I mentioned that you had been uh, the deputy director of yeah. the conflict institution at, at Queen's. Was it a diff difficult task to, to jump from there to Liverpool? Or was it just, I mean, was that just a natural progression? The, the job I have is a, an endowment from the Irish government for the peace process. So it was, it's not a jump in any, I was very happy at Queen's. Uh, Part of the reason for coming was the kids were away and, uh, you know, we were in our fifth day, both fifth day. Let's try something different. Very much part of that. And then also, uh, because of the endowment, it means we can do interesting things. But you, you've got, we've got money to do things. So that was, that was one of the reasons for doing it, uh, because we've then been able to do all the civic society work and, you know, the engagements with Republicans and unionists. And, and it just was another sort of type of resource. And it allowed us to do things, you know, more accelerate what we were doing. And uh, we'd lived in Liverpool before. And it's like, like I'm sorry, I, I've never, it, it's just a wonderful place to live. I've lived in London, I've lived in America. I've never lived anywhere like Liverpool. It's the most civil, friendly place that I've ever lived. 
I should relate the conversation we had the other morning when you were on your way to the shop and you were saying, I can't speak to you now. I'm going to the shop. I'll ring you when I get back. They don't even sell Belfast Baps here. You can't even get a Belfast Bap. Like, you know, it may have all kinds of cultural institutions, but what, what kind of place is it without a Bap? It's the one thing about it is if you walk into a pub, it, they, I know you get this at home as well, but they talk to you in a very genuine way. I was in the, the before the lockdown, I, I'm six foot one, my mate is six foot three, and his mate is six foot five. And um, we went into a bar, we're standing at the bar, and there's this new scouse man. He looked up, he says, Hey, mate, it's like looking at the Alps. <laughs> <laughs> and there is that thing, the lads, <laughs> play, the, lads the lads I play five a side with would be, if they were from Belfast, they'd be from the Falls or the Shore Road or something like that. They're working class lads. And they have this book. And every week you put a fiver into the book. A fiver, I think, yeah, fiver. And there's, I think there's 40 people in the group all over, okay? And if anybody's made unemployed, they get uh, all their bills paid for three months and I think they get a grand, okay? And what happens is they build it up to 15 grand. So the last couple of years, nobody has uh, been made unemployed. And uh, it's that sort of, you get that sort of community spirit. And then when it gets to 15 grand, uh, they then we do another year. And then when it gets to a grand in McKinney, uh, we all go to the Chester races for a day. So it's, uh, you, you get that, you know, so, so it's actually really interesting. You go to the pub on a Sunday with them the odd time, and they've got these ledgers. And one of it is holidays, day out, looking after each other, et cetera. And it is, uh, you know, sometimes whenever I'm out with them, I sort of think it's what we would have been without the conflict. It's often said that there are two types of immigrants. There are, there are the immigrant who will be where he is. They'll assimilate with the community and the, the, or their new their newfound home. And there's the immigrant who's always coming home. So do you fit into any of the categories? I would fit between the two. Home's still Belfast, I guess that's my home. Uh, and that's where my emotional attachment is. It's, it's definitely there. I'm very happy here. Uh, I have lots of Scouse friends and others, you know. And uh, but it is uh, there. There is there. There is a, an attachment to home, uh, and it's not somewhere. I suppose several several times in my life I have tried to escape, to be honest with you. <laughs> but uh, each time I've ended up coming back, and. Uh, it's it no there, there's something there's something about home there, there, there's an affinity or there's a a difference or there you know to be honest with you now there are times when I'm back and I go I want to get away from here now I'm fed up listening to this sure. but look what a luxury to live in two different cultures and to be able to dip in and out of each and as much as you say they're similar they're actually quite different as well and uh, you know the one thing you notice here is is the point I made about those guys like people aren't as caught up in history in the past. They're interested in history in the past, they're not caught up in it. And that, that's the one thing I do notice very, uh, very strongly. We've been, we've been in conversation for almost an hour. Have we? I haven't even yeah. started. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to ask you two things, and, and if you'll indulge me, please. This year is the 20th anniversary of the siege at the Holy Cross. And you mentioned that your expertise, your knowledge is often employed in other conflict resolutions, situations. Are we the worst of the worst or are we getting better? I think one of our problems, we are the worst of not realizing how far we've come. I think our peace process has been really successful and I'm not taken away from events like Holy Cross and other events. Uh, look at the surveys we do. Look at that generation under the age of 40, completely different attitude to virtually everything. Uh, you know, car pulls up behind you now, you're not, you're not worrying. Uh, you're not putting a bolt in the door, Joe, when you go to bed at night. Uh, we've had a whole embedded process of inter-community interaction. Uh, when, I, when, when I was taking friends of mine called Seamus to Lynn Dream Mats, I wasn't saying, I'm, I'm gonna call you Billy, I just take the mate Seamus now. Similarly, when I was going up to West Belfast, they weren't saying, don't mention this, don't mention that. Uh, 
1972, the police seized 20,000 kilograms of explosives. Last year, half a kilogram. Uh, we don't have uh, the political process bumbles along, but it's still a process. Uh, we have, uh, we're not bringing another generation of people through the misery of being in the security forces or crime forces, whatever you want to call them, Joe, or the immiseration of imprisonment. Uh, we have had a significant improvement in the quality of life of women uh, through, the, 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 you know, the, your lifetime, Joe, for employment, massive transition, significant growth for the Catholic middle class. I'm starting to sound like the Northern Ireland Tourism Board here. Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, we've created this new economy, that software economy in Belfast, fast, dynamic, creating professional jobs, the film industry. The question is, Joe, why are we not saying that? And in particular, a point to Republicans. Why are we not saying that? Because when I think of that, Joe, people like you, when you were in the when you were in the council, you worked for everybody in this city. So therefore, just because Northern Ireland exists and you don't believe that Northern Ireland should exist, it doesn't mean that you can't turn around and say positive things about this place. And, and I don't mean that in any way patronizingly. No, 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 no. Because because for me, the more we transform this society it makes the constitutional decision easier, whether we change or don't change. Yeah. And look at those things. And, and I think one of the problems is we have too few people saying about, you know, the dreary, look, see when I look, see when you have that thing in your mind and you look back in time, whenever I look back to the troubles or the conflict, whatever you want to call it, it's monochrome. We have color now. Yeah. We have ways in which we just, you know, you went to the bars and you sat and somebody pushed through the, couple of lads came in drunk and they pushed the door open and you were, everybody looked at, come on. You know, it's a completely different, not completely different, mass. it's like the research we do, Joe, and you go and talk to young lads who are at risk in areas like West Belfast and something out there. They don't mention sectarianism. It's drug problems, it's poverty problems, it's family dysfunction. Why are we not saying that? Or why are we trapped in this, you've got me going now. Why, have you, well, why are we trapped in this two tradition model? I'm sorry, my tradition, I'm British, Irish, whatever those things are. I am fed up with this binary about who we are and what we are. Yet you see the stuff in the survey, young people, I'm not nationalist, I'm not unionist. That doesn't mean they don't have constitutional preferences, but all of that is critically important and we should be screaming it from the rooftops. Uh, just the point that you make there, I, uh, which I agree with, by the way. I agree with. First time for everything. Well, I have taken to watching Scottish television to the Scottish Parliament, the SNP, particularly the SNP. I think there's great lessons that we can learn from a Republican perspective. Yeah. The SNP, that, not perfect, of course. But the, the intensity of those debates in that chamber is every bit as hot as the Assembly. And nobody talks about the Scottish Assembly on the verge of collapse or... Their, or conflict and it, it's it's what's taken as the cut and thrust of political engagement. I think sometimes, uh, and it, it's easy to blame the media, I think sometimes collectively we don't look at the progress that we've made because we, we're in the middle of it. The last five minutes, the last five minutes for you. Sorry, can I just pick up on that? Yes, of course. Say I sat here, right? And you said, not, I don't think you would say, but say somebody from a nationalist background said to me, the South of Nirvana, big growth economy, blah, 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 blah. And if I turn around and I say, well, actually, it's got the highest rate in Europe of working poor. It's got this problem of transfer pricing and false, false growth and all that. See, when I say that, I'm not saying that as somebody who's pro-union. I'm saying that to somebody who's telling me that it's a utopia or that it's a better place and I think a Republican should be questioning that as much as somebody. So whenever you come into a debate with evidence and somebody can then challenge that with other evidence, that's exactly what a debate is. So, so one of the things that really is one of my bugbears, if I say something negative about Republicans or if I say something negative about nationalism, I also say negative things about unionism. If I say negative things about the South, that is not a pro-union thing. That is somebody saying, there's really serious issues here. Look at the poverty in Dublin. Look at the abandonment of the rural communities. So, you know, if, if we're going to have this proper debate about the future, you have to take, give and take, not give and take in terms of agreement, but give and take in terms, somebody has a right to say, I have a, 
I, I have information here. It's not coming from an ideology. It's coming from, this is a fact. Can we, can we discuss these facts? Because then that sharpens up the debate. Sorry. Sorry about that. No, no. I, I mean, th that very much amplifies the, the speech you gave at the Sinn Féin RDS a couple of years ago, where in front of 2,000 plus, you said, what are you doing? Where, where, where's your heads at? And all of that. And I think anybody had thought that you were going to be there to speak as a token anything um, got a rude awakening. And I, I agree with you. I think because you challenge the existing uh, realities doesn't mean that you defend or oppose to him. So if, if, if it was, it was, I, I was very, I, I was very delighted to be asked. And, uh, and uh, <laughs> would you walk up in that speech and you look down and you go, Am I sure about this? <laughs> but anyway, there was a friend of mine who's from Bally Sillon, came and he was sitting down the back and he said, it was the weird, there was two weird moments. <laughs> he said, first of all, you were in this massive screen, he said. And, and then he said, the next thing is, you started all about sectarianism and Celtic football club. I, I made an anecdote about that. And he said he was sitting beside two guys in Celtic shirts. <laughs> and of course, <laughs> they nudged him and went, did you hear what he said? <laughs> what I'm talking about. Ah, you know, he said he turned out and said, ah, you know, those unionists are like. But but even in that, even in that thing is the is the grace to be allowed to go in there and say, I'm not here to harangue you, I'm not here to point fingers, but I think that you have yeah, some superiority sure. here, which which needs to be addressed. Listen, my you know, listen to me, that's the question. That's what I want to do. Oh, I think, well, my view of that, and I and I sat and I listened, and I'm sure thousands listened. My my view of all of that is if you're in the public, if you're in the public arena and you put forward views, be prepared to yeah. have your views agreed with, but, but more importantly, be prepared to have those views challenged. I got 386 emails within 24 hours of doing that. Very good. Are they all, are they all positive? Yeah, all of them, every single one. Right. The only problem was I had to read them, but there was time. Yeah. But uh, I was walking through the airport uh, two months later, and this guy came up, and he says, uh, I, he was Donegal or something like that, and he says, thank you so much for that. You know, So, so those things are tokenistic, they're, they're important, you know? Absolutely. And uh, unfortunately, there was nobody there to hear this praise, but I think it was what it was. What it was. In, your, in your last few minutes, literally the last few minutes, um, Hopes for the future. Well, we'll have to get through the pandemic, and uh, I hope we're not going to have a lot of COVID nationalism. And that, you know, the, the, the NI, you know, the NI rates quicker and all. Let's not get into all of that. Let's, you know, get, you know, the, the, that. Uh, hopes for the future, personally. Uh, I don't want to end up with that, that old saying, careers end in tears. I would like to go where I want to go, and I'd like to look back and be proud. And you know, we're, we're all egotistical, I'll get you out of bed. Uh, so I'd like to look back and think that was worthwhile. I'd like to buy a wee dog, move back to Belfast, walk about, bother nobody, potter about. I'm looking very much to the commodity pottering about years. I, I can do that very well. Uh, Una says to me, you'll not stop, you'll keep working. So we'll see how that pans out. Uh, I hope for my children, uh, you know, uh, uh, one, is, well, one has got a very good job. My son, when he finished university, starts off his new life in the pandemic. I have great hopes for him uh, that he that he finds what he wants to be. Uh, materially, not don't really want anything. Uh, happy to potter about. Uh, I want us to have a proper debate. Uh, we've created this digital platform. I want us to have a proper debate of a constitutional issue. I want for Northern Ireland or Ireland, I want it to become a more socially just society. And uh, I don't know whatever else Santa Claus could be bring me. And you know, at the end of the day, I suppose that thing I said earlier about when you're getting older, you know, it's the wee plain simple things you want. You know, a bit of peace, a bit of quiet, a bit of praise. You know, I hope hope for that for everybody. But the one thing I want more than anything is. That we challenge this economic system which dumps so many people out. That that appalls me. It shocked me that that there's people we're now living in a society in which people who are working are having to go to food kitchen. When I was young, the people you know the families the same as yourself, Joe, the families who were in really dire straits, 
when you were a child where you know they didn't have work. We're now living in a society, we're living in a Europe, in a Western society, in which people who work are going to food banks. That shocks me. That, that's the one thing I would love to see in. I, I counted over 30 things that you wanted to see there, just as you, you spoke. So I'm going to deal with the first five, and I'll, I'll leave the other 25 to you. But can I thank you, Pete, for being kind of a wonderful guest, as you always are. Uh, and I have immensely enjoyed your your company, and I always do. Is so, the tech folks? <laughs> you enjoy you so, enjoy. Let me say something because you praise me a lot, and it's very kind, and I I know you're a genuine soul. Whenever I first came and interviewed you, and we sat, it must have been Culture Land or somewhere. I can't remember what it was. Somewhere in the Falls Road. Culture Land. <clears throat> Was from Culture Land, and it was about 93, 94, and you said things I had not heard before. And it had a real impact upon me. And in my home, I still have that on a tape. No, actually, here in my office, actually, I still have that tape. And I remember I was sitting there, and we were chatting away, and I thought to myself, beyond, you told the story about the falling over the, the stone water jar, yeah. which you can tell that story in your own time. Uh, and I always remember that. And I went away and I thought to myself, there's virtually nothing to buy to me and him in terms of what we want, except for the constitutional pub, which is like saying nothing to buy to him and I except for everything. But, 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 but there was that, but it's not just you, you, you're pumping me up as an outreach and all of that there. You guys outreach too. And, and, I, and that's critically important. It's been, it's been very instructive for me. Can I just tell you something? I had a big finale planned or just to right. clean off, and, and you just cut across it, and we ran out of time. So, okay. Pete, Professor Pete, however you want to be described, thank you. Thank you. I have sir. no doubt that we will we will rejoin this conversation at some stage. So, for for all of the work, for your time, for everything that you have, yeah, that you've enjoyed. Thank you. Cheers. You've been a great guest. Thank you very much.